Now, in keeping with Ray Miller's rules governing noon forums, I am forced to slight uh, many of our members worthy of inclusion due to the constraints of time. Now, today I'll discuss history-making discoveries which have changed our world. Now, where does one start with such a momentous task? Not necessarily in chronological order. I will discuss these more or less by arbitrary standards. Let us turn back to 1937, where one of our medical members, Dr. Perrin Long of Johns Hopkins University, was working in a medical laboratory pioneering work on sulfur drugs. Today, we take for granted the miracle antibiotics and sulfa drugs. In 1937, however, thousands of lives were lost annually to infections, which today are looked on as minor medical episodes. Now, Dr. Perrin Long and his colleagues uh, determined the optimal sulfa drugs, known at that time only in Europe, and demonstrated their clinical effectiveness in the United States. His paper is published and referred to in the Cosmos Club History Book as one of the outstanding histories uh, listed. Now, there is a very amusing incident which changed the course of history and it happened one afternoon in his laboratory. Before telling this instrument, I should point out that many life-saving drugs took a long time before acceptance. Penicillin, for instance, was discovered in 1929, but did not save a single life for over 10 years. Now, returning to Perrin Long's momentous afternoon, one day, one of his colleagues rushed into his laboratory shouting that Eleanor Roosevelt was calling. His medical colleagues were obviously playing a joke on him, and he ignored them until another doctor said, come immediately. Long said he would go along with the joke, picked up the telephone, said, now, okay, now listen here, Eleanor. And over the phone came that voice familiar to millions of radio listeners. I need your help, Dr. Long. It seems that the Roosevelt son had a violent, life-threatening infection that standard treatments had failed to show results. Newspapers were already preparing obituaries, the Roosevelts with the Coolidges and the Lincoln tragedies in the White House. To make a long story short, Perrin Long's sulfa drug saved his life, and the resultant publicity advanced the use by several years, undoubtedly saving thousands of lives. Now, while I'm on the subject of medicine, I'd like to cite another Cosmos Club member. And incidentally, how many of you ever heard of the name of Gregory Pincus? The class of 1931. One of his basic scientific papers is also given in the history of the Cosmos Club. It doesn't sound like a very earth-shaking discovery, however. Uh, this was a basic research paper entitled The uh, Role of Different Factors in the Ovarian life cycle of the guinea pig. However, this, while sounds rather esoteric, it turns up that about in 1950 women, two, 1951, two women came to see Pincus in his Worcester Institute uh, uh, in Massachusetts where he was carrying out his work. 
These two women were Margaret Sanger and Alice McCormick, known, of course, as being the heiress of the McCormick Reacher fortune, Reaper fortune. They had read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and asked him if he could develop a safe birth control such as Aldous, Aldous Huxley had described. And how much money would it take? Pincus thought a moment and said, yes, it is possible. And it would cost several hundred thousand dollars. Mrs. McCormick whipped out her checkbook and wrote a check for a hundred thousand dollars saying, when you need more, let me know. To make a long story short, Dr. Pincus enlisted the help of Dr. Rock of Boston, and ultimately uh, chemists were needed. Dr. Jirasi of Syntex uh, were able to synthesize uh, a, uh, a, an ovarian uh, compound uh, which had exactly the right effect and had very few uh, side effects, and of course, fitted uh, Aldous Huxley's prescription uh, exactly. This uh, menage a trois of Pincus, uh, Rock, and Jirasi, all of different backgrounds, all contributing to the problem in a different way, uh, solved the problem of a cheap method of contraception which the Western world adopted overwhelmingly. And because of its effect on population control, some have even said that Pincus should get two Nobel Prizes, one for medicine and one for peace. He, of course, obtained neither. As an interesting sidelight, I have made a game out of asking doctors the question, who is responsible for the development of the birth control pill? And it seems that only doctors that seem to know uh, are women doctors. And sick transit Gloria Mundi. You can scarcely imagine a more controversial subject, but for better or worse, uh, Dr. Pincus uh, did solve the problem and undoubtedly was revolutionized our social mores and our social thought, again, for better or worse. Now, let's turn to another field. In January of 1939, there was a momentous meeting of the Physical Society in Washington. Niels Bohr had just received word Niels Bohr of Denmark had just received word from Lisa Meitner of the discovery that neutrons split the nucleus of uranium in half with, a re with the uh, result and release of large amounts of energy. He announced this at the meeting and it created quite a sensation. The delegates rushed to phone their colleagues back at the laboratory, and within a week, nuclear fission was demonstrated in several laboratories in the United States. I have a book here which gives a portrait of the attendees at the conference. In this picture, you will recognize many prominent Cosmos Club members. Mer Merle Tuve, Larry Hafstead, Dick Roberts, uh, uh, Ed, uh, uh, Edward Teller, uh, uh, Zillard, just to mention a few. In fact, my rough calculation shows that probably uh, 10 to 15 percent of the attendees at this momentous conf conference were Cosmos Club members. 
As a matter of fact, some of the uh, results uh, were, uh, were very spectacular. And one of the most useful results was discovered uh, right here in Washington when um, uh, Tuve, Hafstead, and Roberts uh, demonstrated that when the, when the nucleus of uranium was bombarded with neutrons, not only did it split the atom, giving the large amounts of energy, but there were additional neutrons emitted from, the, uh, uh, from this reaction. And uh, of great importance, because without it, there would be no nuclear electric power reactors today, it was demonstrated that there were delayed neutrons from fission, which immediately gave rise to the concept that a reactor could be made and controlled in a very orderly fashion. Science having <clears throat> Our first segment shows Glenn Seaborg, a Nobel Prize winner for synthesizing plutonium, an earth-shaking discovery which made possible the plutonium half of the Manhattan Project. Since that time, he has had a distinguished career as university chancellor, advisor to four presidents, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. His list of accomplishments constitutes the longest biography in Who's Who. In this segment, Seaborg describes the details of this momentous discovery. Unbeknownst to me, uh, for, for Boston, I wrote and asked him if it would be all right if I carried on the search for element 94, the next uh, transuranium element. And uh, I had the idea, and I believe uh, I, uh, I knew that Macmillan had tried this approach too, that it might be possible to form a shorter-lived isotope of element 94 by bombarding uranium with deuterons. Uh, the 94-239, the daughter of 93-239, seemed to be so long lived that it would be difficult, the radioactivity therefore correspondingly so low that it would be difficult to uh, identify. Yes, of course, uh, there uh, with regard to Neptunium, I guess, uh, you had, uh, the beta particle the emission had been identified, so yes. you knew there must be... We knew there must be a daughter. We knew but there it, must be a daughter, but uh, if it were long too long life, then the activity, yes. of course, is correspondingly too weak because it's not decaying yes. due to its long life. Yeah. And therefore, uh, it, uh, that would explain why it hadn't been observed by uh, Macmillan and Abelson. So I uh, started a graduate student, Arthur Wall. I had started already before I knew that uh, Macmillan had left uh, to study the chemistry of element uh, 93. Uh, it was known, Macmillan and Abelson had shown that there were two oxidation states, a lower state uh, which uh, could be radioactive form could be carried by a rare earth fluoride and an upper state that was not carried uh, by a rare earth fluoride that was soluble, making it uh, uh, similar to uranium in its chemical properties and not at all like rhenium as it would be in the periodic table uh, of that yeah. day. Uh, so. I, uh, when Macmillan uh, assented, uh, uh, I then uh, used the approach with uh, my colleagues Arthur Wall, uh, the graduate student, and, uh, and Joe Kennedy, who I was working with, of bombarding uranium with deuterons. And then we found another isotope of element 93, which uh, later was shown to have the mass number 238 decaying with a half-life of two days, the difference being, though, that it decayed to a readily identifiable daughter uh, emitting alpha particles. I remember we made that bombardment of uranium with deuterons on December 14, 1940, and uh, we uh, studied the 
chemical properties of this alpha emitter, we felt we must have an isotope of element 94 for the first time, but we couldn't prove it chemically until the night of February 23rd, 24th. We were working in Gilman Hall in room 307, and uh, that night uh, Wall uh, succeeded in oxidizing it with a strong oxidizing agent to a higher oxidation state that could not be carried by a rare earth fluoride carrier. Uh, that way it was separated from all other elements uh, because element 93 could be oxidized with a much uh, weaker oxidizing agent to this non-carryable state. And we knew for the first time that we had found uh, the new element, 94. The element with the uh, mass number uh, 238. We reported that in letters to the Uranium Committee in Washington and uh, these were published. They were held uh, withheld from publication until after the war and then uh, published in the uh, as, uh, letters to the Physical Review. Then Sagre joined us and we made a search for that missing daughter of Macmillan and Abelson's 93-239. We bombarded uh, 1.2 kilograms of urinal nitrate. That was large for those days. Yes. For several days. And then we made a separation by remote control ether extraction to get rid of the uranium and so forth and then lanthanum fluoride, rare earth fluoride cycles of oxidation reduction to uh, remove fission products until we got uh, isolated about a half a microgram of uh, uh, 93239 and uh, let that decay to the daughter 94239 giving a half a microgram of 94239 and uh, then we used the, we used the neutrons from the 60 and cyclotron formed from the bombardment of uh, beryllium with deuterons to produce this sample and then we used the neutrons from the 37 inch uh, cyclotron to prove that it underwent fission with slow neutrons. Oh, yes. That was the... the so big, all, all at once there you had those two things. That uh, was... Uh, 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 that experiment was on March 28, 1941 and that really was the basis for the yeah. plutonium. Oh. Civilian control of atomic energy and the decision to drop the atomic bomb. Uh, it came up in one of our conferences in uh, uh, Washington here about three or four weeks ago, and that is uh, in connection with the, uh, the political civilian control of atomic energy, that uh, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer very strangely opposed civilian control and testified against it. And I... I asked uh, uh, Mr. Hollifield, you know, who was there in the Congress, if he could explain this, and he didn't have any explanation. I've asked several people, and I was wondering, do you have any light to shed on this part of history? Only very dark light. All I can say is that Oppenheimer was an exceedingly complex individual. As a young man, he had severe psychological troubles. He was really genius. I believe Although even of that, I am not quite certain. That he was exceedingly ambitious. But to guess the deeper motives of a complicated individual is really unjustified. 
why he should have done that, which seems to contradict his behavior in many other respects. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, in the modern generation, most people have never even heard that he took that particular stance. Uh, and, uh, he took the stand that the at atomic bomb should be dumped. I think he effectively and cleverly stopped Silla's proposal of a demonstration before it is to be done. And that could have been done. Although Silla did not know enough about the details, how that should have been engineered. If Oppenheimer and Sinat had gotten together on that point, it is conceivable, although not certain, that they might have influenced Truman and American policy in a direction which I believe would have been right. I was a go between and was thrown out of Oppenheimer's office, incidentally, with very kind, convincing, and tactful work. <laughs> Dr. Egeber's distinguished medical career spans combat experience in World War II, Veterans Medical Administration, Dean of USC Medical School, Assistant Secretary of HEW, and perhaps best known for his role as aide-de-camp to General MacArthur as described in his book, The General. He is still active in the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. This segment describes his Japanese experiences. But um, when they dropped the atomic bomb, MacArthur would not let me know. I was very close to him then. I was an aide de camp and doctor, and I think I was, well, I know I was next to his wife, the closest person to him. And uh, it was a not long later that he said, you know, those two bombs gave the emperor, who was not so, didn't feel so strongly about the war as Tojo, about whom I'm going to speak, uh, gave him an opportunity with dignity to admit defeat. And uh, they sent a small group, who I think thought they were going to be killed, uh, down to arrange a truce with us. And in the truce, one thing they wanted was to be allowed to have mortars, machine guns, and small weapons in a place not very far from Tokyo, and at first we couldn't understand such a request, but they explained that that's where the kamikazes were. The kamikazes were people who felt so intensely about dying for the emperor that they were willing to commit themselves to that death beforehand. They were, for the most part, pilots, and they would load their aeroplanes with much more in the way of explosives than a bomb would be, and aim for the target and die with the bombs, or die with the explosion. Uh, they had 10 or 20,000 of them in a stockade not too far from Tokyo, and they wanted this to be able to keep them under control, because they were so warlike that uh, the higher ranking people felt they might do a lot of things not uh, while they were careless with their lives 
that would have caused us um, to come in with a great deal more troops. Yes, that's a very important point that you raised there, and one which I've never seen in the history books. How long ago, uh, after the bombs were dropped did these negotiations that you just described uh, take place? Oh, I would say it was a matter of weeks, uh, yeah. maybe a couple. Within a couple of weeks. Yeah. Very, very, very uh, near after the bombs were dropped. Very and he did, as he saw, the way the Japs were going to defend Kyushu, the southern island, and Honshu, the island on which Tokyo and Yokohama and the big cities are. He felt that it would have been more determined even than the British in the way they intended to defend Britain in case Hitler's armies should land there. Yes, there is that famous speech of uh, Churchill's which describes their determination to defend uh, England. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and that you felt there was that same, same determination. There was that same determination and they had tunnels and underground places where they could gather. It, it would have been, I think he estimated that the Japanese would lose well over a million people, many of them civilians, and we would probably have around 500,000 or more casualties. There more than, I would say two days, maybe three, when we learned that Tojo, the man who I think was the was to Japan what Hitler was to Germany, that Tojo was in the hospital, that he had shot himself. Well, I had a stethoscope that I'd only gotten on General MacArthur by a ruse, and the ruse was tell him when we were in a plane in a high altitude, when I thought his pulse was probably the lowest of any of us, that uh, I had to really listen to his chest to get the good pulse. And I did to all the others, and um, that was the only time I got an air uh, stethoscope on his, uh, on his chest. The only time I had to take care of him. Well, I had a feeling suddenly, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a stethoscope that had been on our leader, MacArthur, and on Tojo's chest? So when I heard about this, I hurried to find out where he was, and he wasn't very far away from our hotel, in a temporary, well, a building taken over and made into a, a personal hospital for him. Well, I know that the general, I knew the general didn't want me to go nosing around too much, but I said I thought Tojo was probably going to die. And wouldn't he like to have me see him and come back with any feelings I had about him? And uh, I think I had to say it several times before he began to say, well, he'll probably be dead before you get there. And finally I said, well, do you mind if I go and find out? So I got down to that hospital, and my gosh, it was, com it was surrounded by MPs, and I don't think I would have gotten in, even though I had the age insignia of a five-star general, if it hadn't been that General Eichelberger came out the door, and him, or he, him, he, I knew, him, I knew. Uh, Roger, what are you doing here? And uh, I told him I came down, and I hinted, though I didn't really tell a lie, that MacArthur was interested in my seeing Tojo. And uh, he, I said, uh, how'd we get him? Well, he skipped that question, and I was ushered in by him, so I was well received. And uh, there lay this Japanese man. He, I'll tell you why he was in a hospital in a minute. But he had his eyes closed, just like this. Now, 
We thought he could understand English, but he wasn't speaking it. The reason he was there? Well, we had five days when we were not to enter Tokyo, but to stay in Yokohama or behind that. And we didn't have many troops there. But some correspondents doing what co good correspondents should do, uh, and they wore uniforms just like ours, but they had no insignia. But from the back or the side or in front, if you didn't know enough, you'd think that they were our soldiers. Well, they looked up where he lived, and uh, they must have had a job finding that out and also finding out where that place was, because it isn't like streets in our countries. You have to go to an area and say, well, where is such and such? And they'll give it a name, and it's over there. And then you have to go over there, and you want to know such and such. Well, he's probably over there. And you find your way to where you're going, not by an address. Well, these correspondents thought, let's go and see if we can see Tojo. And by God, they found his place. And Tojo looked out and saw what he thought were two American soldiers come to arrest him. And he shot himself. He missed his heart. Now, Tojo, if he had done what he wanted any soldiers to do, that was if there was any shame coming, he should commit harakiri. But that meant putting a knife in low in the belly and ripping yourself up, disemboweling yourself. And he, probably for himself, took a more cowardly way, shooting himself. Well, they got scared, I guess. But the rumor was around, and there was a strong rumor in close headquarters, close in the headquarters, that these correspondents had scared him and then when he shot himself, it scared them. And uh, they notified us <laughs> where he was and how they could get him. That's an ama amazing story. And the, uh, the, ner the nerve and the uh, Correspondent. courage of those correspondents is yeah. unbelievable. Uh, Isn't it? It shows uh, the, uh, how uh, these war correspondents, they just get right into the thick of things. Uh, they do. And you know that in the overall statistics of mortality, percentage-wise, they lost more than the army. Is that correct? Yeah. Amazing. There were more of them killed than the army. Now, that may not mean more than 20 or 30 or something yeah, like but that. Percentage, but uh, but percentage-wise, it was more than the overall army. Well, I saw that there was a doctor there, and I didn't want him to think that I was going to nose in and pretend that I could take care of the patient better than he. So I took my stethoscope out and I said, this has been on MacArthur's chest. And I would just like to have it on Tojo's chest. Now, I'm not assuming that I know anything. I won't keep it on long enough to make it look as if I'm out doctoring you. But will you give me that courtesy or whatever you want to call it? And he said, oh, sure, go ahead. So I went up to Tojo. He didn't open his eyes. He lay there in his bed like, just like that. He, he couldn't have closed them tighter. And uh, I pulled down the cover and saw where the bandages were. And he had just missed his heart, apparently. And uh, I put my stethoscope in and I put it here and here. I may have put it in three places. That doesn't make any difference. I had my stethoscope on Tojo's. <clears throat> Louis Alvarez is probably the most versatile scientist I have interviewed. In addition to de winning the Nobel Prize, he discovered tritium, trinary fission, built the first large-scale bubble chamber, ground control radar, which made possible the Berlin air lift, and most recently the extinction theory. This segment describes how Oppenheimer directed him to develop the instruments to determine the yield of the atomic bomb and to fly on the Enola Gay mission to Hiroshima. Would get me overseas. 
I had been overseas in the European theater with radar, and I thought it would be interesting to get out into the Pacific. So he said, well, as a matter of fact, we have a job that I think just fits you. This normally, when you develop a new weapon, like a new bomb or anything of that sort, new rifle shell, you take it out to Aberdeen test, testing grounds and you test it and test yes. it and test it, learn all about it. You learn how well it shoots and how much energy it releases. So we haven't got as many test devices yeah. to shoot, to do that kind of a program. So we're going to have to take the proving grounds over enemy territory, make the, make the tests when the bombs are dropped in combat. So he said, will you figure out some way to measure the yield of the bombs that we drop on Japan. So I figured out a way to do that using the acoustic method. We eventually, very quickly I should say, very quickly designed and built uh, pressure measuring devices which could be dropped out of an accompanying airplane on parachutes which would then stay essentially put drops, dropping slowly as the two airplanes made approximately 180 degree turns, quote, get the hell out, unquote. Mm -hmm. And then the acoustic sensor pressure measuring device in the parachute cages would then radio the signals back to the airplane where they'd be recorded on cathode ray tubes. So you got uh, you got a recording of the response. We got the recording. Well, we got pressure versus time curve mm -hmm. and then using theory and knowing the distances and the altitudes, you could calculate oh, yeah. the pressure. Now the difficulty with this is that nobody paid a speck of attention to our measurements because before we had a chance to reduce our measurements, President Truman announced that the yield of the bomb was 20,000 tons of TNT. That was uh, one of the projected uh, uh, yields and he didn't know that, he just thought that was a number and so he released that and for, I don't know, 25 years that was the quote standard unquote yield of the Hiroshima bomb. But oh, then, yeah. People at Los Alamos couldn't make those numbers agree with what they measured in Hiroshima. The, the intensity of the burning and the various other indicators of pressure that they had made it look like it was somewhat less. Oh yeah. So somebody remembered that we'd made some measurements and I got started getting letters from Los Alamos saying, could we see your records? They didn't even have our records. I had them in my personal files. And so I made Xerox copies of them sent them to Los Alamos and they analyzed them and said, well, it looks more like 13 kilotons. And that is now the accepted number and is now being used in place of the old standard 20 kilotons as the Hiroshima number. Yes, well, I, I, uh, that's... The Harold Agnew probably told you all that. No, he, he didn't tell us uh, quite uh, the, the end of that yeah. story. That, that, that those were the measurements which finally clarified the discrepancy that's there. Good. Yeah. So I'm glad to get that additional piece of information. Well, that, uh, that is a uh, fascinating uh, story, uh, and um, incidentally, uh, one of the things I've heard is that, uh, and I'd like to have you uh, just make at least a brief mention of it, is that uh, your idea of trying to get a message uh, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the emperor through one of these parachutes, and I'm not sure how, uh, whether this is apocryphal or, or uh, or how much fact and uh, there is to that. No, story. it's an absolutely true story. Uh, uh, Harold Agnew and I, as he probably told you, flew over Hiroshima, but neither of us flew over Nagasaki. But yes. the same pressure gauges were in the airplane that accompanied the uh, bomb dropping airplane to Nagasaki. Oh, yes. And uh, Larry Johnson, that I measured, mentioned earlier, and a couple of our sergeants from the Los Alamos. Uh, SET group uh, were in the plane and dropped the gauges and got the measurements. So we got a good measurement over Nagasaki as well. Oh, yes. I didn't go along and Harold didn't go along. But the night before, I did get this idea that it would be interesting to get a message to the Japanese high command. And so I sat down and wrote a letter out longhand to my friend. Uh, Dr. Sagani, who was at the University of Tokyo and who had spent a year and a half or so in Berkeley before the war. And oh, I, yes. I knew him quite well. And I addressed it to Dr. Ryukichi Sagani, 
from three of your former colleagues at the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory. I had enlisted uh, encouragement and support of two of my friends, Bob Serber and Phil Morrison, so they, none of us signed our names, but at least there were three of us instead of just one. Oh, yeah. I wrote the thing out by hand, and they approved it, and uh, then we made uh, carbon copies. In fact, when I wrote the original letter, I made two carbon copies, and we put them in envelopes and taped them onto the pressure gauges, and they were dropped out over Nagasaki. Oh, yeah. I have actually seen the uh, report of the naval officer who uh, opened those envelopes, who uh, probed around in the uh, pressure gauges. I've always thought he must have had a lot of courage because the newspaper reports, in this country at least, said that the pressure, that the bombs were dropped on parachutes. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. So, so he must have thought that there was a good chance that he was probing <laughs> around with an atomic bomb. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, fascinating. Of course, I, uh, I guess the fact that those instruments were uh, dropped by parachute uh, confused people. Uh, that's right. There was never any mention yeah. of the instruments. It was just that the parachutes were seen yes. coming down. Oh, yeah. The interesting thing there is that I have in my files at home both one of the letters that went down at Nagasaki Oh, yeah. Dr. Sagani sent it to me after the war. I sent him a full set of physical reviews from the whole war period. Oh, yes. I had to do that surreptitiously because General MacArthur didn't want any intercourse between the Americans and the Japanese in the field of physics. You know, oh, yeah. he destroyed the 16 psychotron. Yes, I remember and that side of case. So I, I got these to Sagani by a kind of a circuitous route. And uh, as a favor in return, Sagani sent me the letter. In oh. fact, he had already given it to Arthur Compton's brother, Wilson Compton, who was then president of uh, uh, Washington State College. Oh, yes. But at uh, my suggestion, Sagani wrote President Compton a letter asking if he would give this letter to me, which President Compton did at halftime during a football game here at Cal Stadium when Washington State College was playing Cal. And I had an appointment to meet uh, Wilson Compton. He gave me the letter. So I have the letter in my files, the one that actually came down. I also have the pressure gauge. Oh, yes. That's uh, fascinating. Now, incidentally, uh, uh, there are there copies of that letter uh, in any of the archives of the nation? That, uh, I know there's one in the uh, museum in Hiroshima. There is one in Hiroshima. Yeah, okay. Uh, but none in this country. I don't know that there are any. Probably there are. It's it's, it's been reproduced a lot of times. It has been reproduced. There was an article about it by uh, Lowell Thomas in the uh, um, Saturday Evening Post one time. It was entitled, Under Separate Cover, One Atomic Bomb. Oh, yes. <laughs> the other thing that's probably important is that uh, I learned that that letter did get to the high command essentially immediately. They took it seriously, and the fact is that they offered to surrender the next day. Whether that had anything to do with it, I don't know, but I, I like to think it did. Now, to Professor Sagani, from three of your former scientific colleagues during your stay in the United States. We are sending this as a personal message to urge that you use your influence as a reputable nuclear physicist to convince the Japanese general staff of the horrible consequences which will be suffered by your people if you continue in this war. You have known for several years that an atomic bomb could be built if a nation were willing to pay the enormous cost of preparing the necessary material. Now that you have seen that we have constructed the production plants, there can be no doubt in your mind that all the output of these factories working 24 hours a day will be exploded on your homeland. Within the space of three weeks, we have proof fired one bomb in the American desert, exploded one in Hiroshima, and fired the third this morning. 
We implore you to confirm these facts to, to your leaders and to do your utmost to stop the destruction and waste of life which can only result in the total annihilation of all of your cities if continued. As scientists we deplore the use to which a beautiful discovery has been put, but we can assure you that unless Japan surrenders at once, this reign of atomic bombs will increase many-fold in fury.